My name is Mitch Guthrie, and this is the Long Letter Podcast, episode 21. And I am uh, excited for this episode. It is the last episode in the series that I've been doing on the book, Grace Can Lead Us Home, A Christian Call to End Homelessness. And uh, I'm going to use this episode to wrap up chapter 8 and the conclusion in the book. But before I do that, I kind of want to talk about why I feel like this was a good resource for this topic. And one of the first reasons off the bat is that it's a short book. It's not very long. And when you're vying for people's time and attention and they want to get up to speed on a resource, it's nice to be able to um, point them in the direction of a book that is easy to consume. And uh, the writing level of the book is also, it's not too verbose. It's not uh, overly technical. And I feel like all these things are Uh, One good reason why the book is a good resource for understanding or getting up to speed on these particular issues. And so the second thing that I like about this book is that even if you don't agree with the author's conclusions, if you don't land where the author does in this book, I think there's still value in that he defines terms that... Um, people might just assume that they know what that means. So things like harm reduction uh, or even addiction and how these things relate to each other, I feel like the book is valuable in the sense that it kind of defines terms and everybody can kind of come to the table on that and discuss the issue at hand. Do I expect everybody to be in total agreement with this book? No, I'm not even in total agreement with this book, but that's not the point of books. The the point that I utilized this book for was to start the discussion, to have that discussion on uh, these topics. And so I feel like for those two reasons, it's been a good resource to give to people. And it's generated a lot of, I think, good discussion, both on this podcast, as well as kind of to other people that I've given the book to or who have purchased the book or whatever. And it's kind of nice because he has an audible book that he narrates himself, the author, Kevin Nye. And that's always something that I like in books. So um, some of my favorite audible books or audio audible books are uh, narrated by the author that wrote them. You just get more of their voice, I feel like. Uh, so not only is the voice in the writing, but it's in their actual voice. And I think that's useful. And so, yeah, I feel like this has been a, a good um, resource for starting this discussion on these topics. I think it's good for introducing people to the concepts at hand. And uh, I do feel like it was like pretty valuable. And so we'll move into now talking about the last two sections of the book, which is chapter eight. And then he goes into, um, he has a conclusion. So I want to kind of touch on those and that'll wrap up this series. So I'd like to thank everybody that's participated in discussing this. I had uh, a co-host, Nate Judd, uh, for a little bit there. I've had guests on. Um, I can't think of all of you off the top of my head. I'm going to forget some, so I'll just say thank you to all the guests that have been on the show to talk about this and talk through this. And um, for those who have provided me feedback, I appreciate that as well. So chapter eight, he starts here on um, this, this chapter is titled Abundance, Beauty, and Celebration. And I feel like the first paragraph really sets the tone for what he's going to talk about in this chapter. So I'm going to read it in its entirety. This is the first paragraph. Working in the field of homelessness, it is easy to fall into a mindset of scarcity, to see only tragedy, ugliness, and pain, and to live in a constant state of exasperation. The sheer amount of need relative to available resources, housing, treatment beds, jobs, benefits, can leave us fighting over what are essentially the table scraps of the privileged. Sitting with so much unnecessary suffering takes its toll. Resentment, secondary trauma, even rage. Many days I find myself battling the temptation to surrender to despair. And that is really where he starts this chapter to kind of like set the table, if you will, because 
it is a lot of work and it is very discouraging. I'm friends with a lot of people that work uh, in this field and it can be just incredibly disheartening, um, especially when we start considering certain things, what we would consider a win. Um, it is hard. It is very difficult when people need housing and there isn't housing available for them. It's very difficult when people need resources and they can't get those resources or they go through this whole process only to be denied those resources or there is some minor thing that puts them out of the category to be able to receive those resources. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And, you know, while burnout and despair is real, um, spending time with the homeless, especially those that have been unhoused for a long time, renews the author's sense of mission. So he finds when he starts to really struggle and uh, despair, as he says, that he'll kind of take a step out of that and kind of return to the community part of his job where he is seeing and interacting with the unhoused. And he finds that it actually, instead of bringing more despair, um, renews him and it gives him, it kind of restores his sense of mission. And to find beauty and joy in the midst of struggle um, becomes a necessity. And that's what this chapter uh, talks about. And so the author reminds himself, he says, and I quote, that if, as Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of these, you have done for me, then spending time with the unhoused and the poor is spending time with Jesus. When this is done without hurry and without a need to fix or achieve anything, God is near and hope is renewed. And I, I feel like what he's trying to say is that, or the way I'm interpreting it, the way that I'm taking this, is that sometimes we get into a mindset of working economically with people. I do this, you do this. I give you this, you give me this. We, we work in these very economic fashions that can be um, counter to the purpose of community, um, where we exist alongside one another. And I feel like what he's trying to return to here is this deep well of community, of just being side by side with somebody, not always trying to work some sort of thing or uh, I hate to say this, work an angle or anything like that. It's about just existing in the, the present moment. And uh, he goes on to say uh, that people ask him, how do you keep going in this work? He says, I offer the following observations and stories. This chapter is rooted in a theological belief that God is especially present with those who are suffering and that God became incarnate in a broken world and announced grace in spite of it. So that's really the premise of what he's going to write about here. And he starts out this next section on scarcity and abundance. And he starts by reflecting on John chapter 2, the gospel of John chapter 2, where Jesus goes to the wedding and he turns the water into wine, uh, 150 gallons worth of wine, which is a lot of wine. I have been to a lot of weddings. I have never seen 150 gallons of wine, but, you know, to each their own. Um, and he reflects on this story, which he used to kind of think was really quaint and really, uh, I don't know, folksy or whatever. But as he has thought more on it, um, he quotes Walter Brueggemann. Walter Brueggemann is an a Old Testament scholar, and uh, Brueggemann has this to say. Filled with God's generosity, Jesus went around to people suffering from scarcity, of health, of acceptance, of power, of understanding, and replaced it with a gift of abundance. And so this is where he's kind of framing this idea that, yeah, there's scarcity, there, there's shortages everywhere, but there is also kind of acting in the way that Jesus acted in bringing abundance to those that didn't have it. Um, this, this idea of suffering from scarcity, um, and that scarcity is in different categories like health or acceptance, um, power, whatever. Jesus was, uh, very focused on and addressing that in, in his ministry. And so he, kind of shifts gears and talks about the center, which is the place that he works for. And he talks about coffee hour. 
this is where the center opens their doors, have people come in and they can just have coffee. And he, he makes kind of an interesting point about coffee. Um, one of those points is that coffee is like both a luxury and ubiquitous. It's kind of everywhere, but there's also like specialty type coffee things out there. So we have a lot of coffee shops. You can go anywhere and find multiple coffee shops on the same block and they might specialize in different, well, I'm not a coffee connoisseur, so I couldn't tell you, but we have coffee everywhere, but we also have it. It's, it's ubiquitous also in another sense that it is um, like in gas stations and, you know, other places that you can just drop by. I mean, if anybody has had church coffee, if you can call it that, knows what he's talking about here. So in one sense, coffee is kind of a luxury. It's kind of something that's uh, special and can be high end. And I mean, if you've ever had a friend who's like a total coffee dude, uh, with the pour over method and all this crap and they grind their own, roast their own beans. And it, yeah, like it becomes just like an entire hobby, entire, um, personality trait all on its own. But there's the other fact that it's kind of everywhere. There's always coffee somewhere at some function. And he goes on to reflect on this. He says to give away for free, something normally thought of as a luxury is to take a posture of abundance. It is an audacious biblical truth to an unbelieving world. You deserve more than mere survival. Your humanity amounts to more than the sum of your basic needs. I feel like that is a pretty strong statement there. And um, I, f I also feel like that I've seen that kind of ring out. When we talk about people who don't deserve something, um, especially when it comes to the unhoused or those who are living below the poverty line or whatever, there is this idea that, well, sure, they deserve maybe this thing, but not this other thing, or that there are certain like little luxuries in life that they shouldn't have because they're poor. And this idea that, um, they're poor or whatever can be very, um, pernicious is the word I think I'm looking for. Um, that that their humanity sort of amounts to uh, just what they can afford or what they have. And uh, he goes on to the next section to kind of address this a little bit more on uh, avocado toast. So he says, in 2016, avocado toast trended on social media. An op-ed published in The Australian pointed to millennials' taste for the popular treat as a prime example of the generation's foolish spending habits, clearly to blame for their difficulty affording such things as a down payment on a home. It is yet another form of the pernicious belief that people deserve their poverty. He says pernicious in there. I, my mind probably just uh, buried that away. <laughs> and, but yes, uh, that's his quote there. And I was actually thinking about this because there is like this idea that like, if you want a home and you can't afford a home, then you shouldn't live with any sort of uh, joy in your life. You sacrifice all these things to be able to get that. Now, there's something to be said about working hard and making sacrifices to obtain uh, something big like that. And I'm not, I don't think he's putting that down and I'm not putting that down. But I do think that that, that type of thinking can actually extend maybe a little bit deeper than that, where we start getting to what people deserve and what they don't deserve. Or we look at things like avocado toast and we kind of like, I don't know, make judgments that if somebody just didn't do have avocado toast or if they just lived without a refrigerator and a microwave, then they can have these other things. And I'm not quite sure that that plays out in reality very well. Also, um, it seems kind of like a jerk thing to be thinking about people, honestly. Um, and so, like, I was kind of, like, curious. I wanted to look at this myself. So I looked at the Census Bureau. They have data from 2018 to 2022. And um, the median value of owner-occupied housing units between that time, 2018 and 2022, was 306000 for Lewis County, for, for my area where I live. And the median income household for that same time period, 67000 So the household, the house, 306000 The income for that house, 67000 
housing is incredibly expensive. And I think it's kind of foolish to stop and take a look at somebody who's having a minor luxury in their life and being like, that's why they don't have a house and ignoring just the whole slew of other systemic issues that are at play that might prevent a person from being able to own their own home, especially when you look at the data like this. I even like looked up uh, Realtor.com and the median sold home price in Lewis County for 2023, so just last year, just a few months ago, was $395,000. Our income has not grown with the cost of a house. And I think people are feeling that. And when you factor in things like inflation and so on and so forth, you sure you can ask people to sacrifice their occasional avocado toast. I don't even like avocado toast myself. Um, but I think that's just kind of a scapegoat for the actual underlying issues that are at play here. And I think that's what he's trying to, to point out, um, is that we need to be more mindful that there's usually more at play than just somebody's, um, you know, indiscretion in how they spend their money. And that's not to deny that people do and can spend their money in stupid ways or set themselves back. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about kind of the mindset that's, well, you, if you don't have this, you, you've you obviously deserved to not have this thing. and um, Or that you need to live some very austere thing or any sort of joy that you could take out of life should be delayed so that you can get this thing like other people have this thing. And um, I think that's a very poisonous view of things. I think that um, has a real potential to... Um, get us working more uh, or uh, put us in a position where we're working more economically with people than we are relationally with people. And so um, it's also reductionistic. Uh, so he, he goes on. He talks about how he had started baking bread because one of uh, his favorite stories is the feeding of the 5,000. And with relatively few ingredients, he was able to make bread. And it was like really good. And he liked doing it as a hobby. And he would reflect on uh, the stories of the Israelites in the desert with manna and how the wafers, uh, or they taste like wafers made with honey. Um, and then reflecting on John chapter two, the wine that uh, Jesus, uh, the water that Jesus turned into wine and how that wine was better than the good wine. And so while he makes this with his own hands, while he's working in these things, he's reflecting on these stories of abundance. He's also reflecting on how it could have been another way, like uh, this idea that the the wafers tasted good, that they were a little sweet, is something that didn't have to be. It could just be a bare, bare bones manna or whatever you want to call it. But the reflection on it is that it's something that's also good. It has, um, it's something that people would look forward to having, and. Uh, as the center has, they've, they've we talked in earlier episodes about uh, Women's Day, where they dedicate a day to just women being able to come into the center and get the resources that they need, and um, that was to serve that um, demographic that they were missing. They didn't have this demographic matching the actual numbers of their area, and one of the reasons why is that some women will just not come in uh, ever if if there are going to be men present due to um, the fear or uh, threat, threatening nature of what they've experienced in their life. And so they've dedicated one day to, to uh, letting women come into the center and just use the resources and spend time there. And so they had a rotating schedule where he would, or where each staff member would make breakfast for uh, women's day and his, his day just happened to lie in the week that this article on avocado toast landed. And so using his bread making skills and everything, the women's day at the center, they had avocado toast. With, and it sounded like amazing. It's like avocado toast, bacon, fried egg. He named a bunch of stuff. Um, and he kind of ends this section. So it was like a little nod to, okay, you've told us that, you know, people don't deserve avocado toast if they're poor. And so he kind of flipped it on its head to have a little luxury with people who might not normally be able to have that luxury. And he ends this section with, uh, with this. He says, the center has been rooted in the belief that, as Brueggemann says, 
if you share your bread with the neighbor, the world will be made new. And I think this goes back to being less about avocado toast or whatever, um, and more about how we engage in community and people's worth and what they deserve or don't deserve. And kind of getting out of that mindset of what I'm referring to as kind of economical thinking. And so the next section he gets into here is on beauty. And in this section, he discusses uh, like how we present and portray homelessness. And his example is advocates of the unhoused who are looking to raise donations will often take uh, cameras and um, do videography out in encampments to capture just how bad and uh, sad and dark and evil it is or, or whatever. Um, it reminds me of those commercials in the 90s with the lady that would always cry and the pictures of the children that were uh, destitute and, and so on. Um, you know, and I think, I think they have a good reason for wanting to do that. They are like, hey, look at these conditions. People shouldn't live like this. Um, let's use this to raise money for this cause, to advocate uh, advocate for the homeless or unhoused. And what's funny though is in this, he only talks about the advocates, but I've I've found that both advocates advocates, 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 and critics both use the same picture, uh, pictures and footage and whatever. So like we have advocates that go out there and you know get B-roll of people on the streets and people in encampments, but we also have things like uh, Como News doing their Seattle is dying stuff where they're doing the exact same thing. Both sides of this discussion are utilizing uh, photos and videography as a way to um, stir up a certain type of sentiment um, toward this population. And what he wants to address here is that you can at the same time, also be sort of denigrating that population that you desire to help. Now, obviously, people on one end of the spectrum that use that footage to show that Seattle is dying or whatever you want to say, they don't care about how they're representing homelessness. But advocates do care, and they are sort of incidentally portraying this sort of lack of beauty. They're, they're dehumanizing, even if they're trying to help, I guess, is what he says. Um. And he talks about our sort of removing beauty from this picture that we could look for and find in this. And he says, because of our failure to perceive beauty among the unhoused, we are often satisfied with banishing services to dysfunctional and dingy facilities. Having visited many shelters and other service providers over the years, it's not hard for me to understand why unhoused people can be turned off to these resources. When it comes to service provision, we comfort ourselves by saying it's better than nothing, letting ourselves off the hook for having a space that doesn't reflect the dignity of the people we welcome into it. And I think I think it's a great quote. I think he's got a point there. Um, you know, when we go into these spaces where the unhoused are and we put them on display and we show just how pitiful and sad all this is, we also sort of deny the little community that they've developed there. Um, we overlook potential little pockets of beauty that can exist even in this terrible situation. And I've said this before. I've said it many times on this podcast. Like nobody is pro encampment, but there is a sort of self-organizing nature to it and a community to it that I think needs to kind of be recognized um, while recognizing how difficult and uh, how much suffering is going on, you know, in this in this environment. And so um, let let's just be careful then that we don't dehumanize the people that we're here to address in this. And um, he says that kind of reflects in how churches and service providers sometimes build facilities. Now, one thing that he recognizes that churches and, and service providers often don't have like they, they don't have big budgets. They don't have a ton of stuff. Therefore, the facilities that they have are kind of what they have. Um, but even in that, even in the midst of that, it's not a reason to 
um, I guess just be okay with that. We don't need to just let that be just that the way it is. Um, while our resources and abilities to address uh, some of the stuff may be limited, we can still bring beauty into uh, these places. And I think uh, recently, this last week, I went to a community town hall and they talked about um, our current homeless shelter and how the building wasn't really designed for people. It was designed to be a warehouse and it's been co-opted and utilized for people ever since we've needed the shelter. And they are currently in the process of building a shelter for people that um, is specific to people. And I, I thought that was, um, I thought that was good. I'm glad that they're they're recognizing that. I'm glad that they're factoring that into their decision making process. Um, before they had lined up this other shelter, though, there there were some in our community that had the sentiment, "Well, that's you know, this is just what they deserve." I mean, whatever we got, then. That's as good as it gets. Beggars can't be choosers. And this isn't about like beggars being choosers. This is about um, kind of bringing in a little bit of beauty and humanity to these spaces, even if they're not ideal. Um, And so, yeah, it was good to hear that this new shelter that they're developing is developed for people. And I'm excited to see what will come of that. Um, And he says, you know, here – He talks about the center again, um, and he talks about Henry, you know, and I'll I'll read the quote here. Henry, one of our most prolific artists, loves to take any new staff member or volunteer on a tour of the building, always careful to point out all his pieces adorning our walls. Currently, our Women's Day participants each have a small pot of flowers that they can return to water each week. And I think this goes back to kind of what he's talking on in this whole chapter which is making space for beauty, making space for kind of humanity here. It doesn't have to be cold, dark, and dingy or just the bare minimum that we can do. We can um, try to bring life to things. And and I reflect on this even in my own household. Um, You know, if it were up to me, I just don't think of plants. I don't think of them, but I enjoy their presence in my home and somehow they magically show up in my house and they get watered regularly and they bring life to my house. And that's my wife. She's kind of always bringing that sort of beauty to our home, even if it's in small, simple ways. And it's easy to not see that in its absence but once it's there, you might not always catch it as as obvious, but but if it were to be taken away, you would feel the difference in our home. Likewise, you would feel the the difference in these other um, places that we develop for people who are unhoused, who are struggling, suffering, maybe with addiction and mental health issues. And so I think it is important to keep that concept of beauty in mind. This next section he's got titled, Everyone Deserves a Party. And it has to do with the renovations that they did to one of their buildings. Um, And they had a big soiree for board members and donors and community stakeholders to come in and enjoy and see the new building and its grand opening. And then they realized during the party that they had left out the actual community that they intend to serve with this building. And I have to kind of give him kudos for admitting to recognizing that I, I, that can't, that can be embarrassing, especially if that's your, if that's your main focus. Um, I think sometimes organizations can make missteps or not recognize they get so hyper-focused on the thing at hand that they don't realize um, maybe how they're underserving even a part of their, their mission there. And so they had looked around and realized we're having this party with all these fancy people and we haven't even invited the community that this building's for and what is the purpose of our mission here. So they decided to hold another party and this is what they've titled Everyone Deserves a Party. And um, they now hold this every year and it's kind of like a big soiree, but it's for the actual community of unhoused people that they serve. And 
I felt like it was kind of a fun story because I could see people doing this by accident, just not recognizing. And it's not that there isn't a time and a place to have a separate type of um, meeting or function, just like he talks about Women's Day. Like, I think that's okay to have. It serves a certain purpose. But when it comes to, um, you know, do we throw parties for other people? Do people who don't deserve it? I put that in quotation marks. Um, you know, there's that mindset that creeps in sometimes. And so the Bible's insistence on God's care and concern for the suffering and the poor should be reflected in our own practices and functions. Um, it basically is what I think he's getting at here. And sometimes we fail that and we need to kind of go back, revise, and keep trying. And I'm a big proponent of always reforming, always kind of thinking and and reworking how we do something to make sure that we're doing it the way we should be doing it and representing ourselves and our God the way that we, we should be. And I know as people, we fail at that. As organizations, we certainly fail at that. And so it is important to reflect and to kind of take a look around and going, well, what are we doing here? Who are we serving? And so then he talks about Alan. Now, this is like two weeks before the Everyone Deserves a Party. This is their fourth annual Everyone Deserves a Party party that they're getting ready for. And two weeks before that, uh, one of their well-known patrons of the center, Alan, uh, goes missing. He kind of falls off the grid. Uh, it sounds like he has a very gregarious personality, bigger than life. He wanted to make it big in Hollywood as a comedian, but apparently his jokes were just terrible and whatever. But he... He was a talker. He was a very integral part of their community. And he had actually been served uh, way early on by the center in getting housing. And he continued to remain a part of the community, even though he had housing. And that's where I think the success of these things does come in, where uh, somebody doesn't just find a resource they need, they find a place to be. And it sounds like Alan did. And he was kind of this big personality at this place. And so everybody was kind of worried when they weren't able to get a hold of him. They hadn't seen him in a few weeks. He, um, His cell phone would just go to a busy signal, um, so on. And so they go to look for him. They call. Uh, they get to his apartment. They knock on the door. It's got – apparently the windows are all barred and the door is this massive door. Um, they can't get in. They don't see anybody. Nobody answers the door. They call the landlord who can't make it down right away, but she also – um, lets them know that he missed a payment. Uh, he was late on a payment and he had never been late on a payment before. And so they kind of got a sinking feeling that something was going on here. Uh, working their way around the house, they um, see a window that's kind of higher up. They get up there and they can see that he is deceased inside, that he he had died. And the author, Kevin Nye, talks about what a heavy hit this was, how how hard it was to hear his friend recognize that there's a dead body inside and knowing right away who it was. And then the fire department coming and breaking in the door and, um, you know, the, the smell associated with death, everything there. On the day before they hold their everyone deserves a party, um, you know, soiree. And... So they kind of avoid going back to the center for a little bit, but knowing that that's what they're doing, they finally get there and they tell, I think they tell the staff uh, what had happened and decided that, you know, the question was, well, do we continue to have the party? And right away the answer was yes. Yes, this is, this is what we should be doing. We should be having this party even uh, if Alan is no longer with us. And so... Uh, they decided to tell some of Alan's closest friends. Um, one decided to stay at the party. The other one decided to leave. And they have the party anyways. And it's just kind of both a sad and joyous affair all at the same time. And I think the story really ca encapsulates what he's trying to get to about this beauty among suffering sort of thing. Um, you know, it is nice when we can when we could just always experience beauty and abundance. But the truth is we're denied that often in life in different places. Um, 
it's kind of hard, especially right now, to not look around and see that sort of lack of and um, feel that pull toward despair. But just like this party, just like Alan, um, there is beauty that we can carve out in suffering. There is sort of this community that we can continue to hold together in in the face of and despite the circumstances sometimes. So he kind of ends the chapter on this. I've come to believe that a space so sacred can be found only when we draw so near to the poor that their pains become ours and their joy becomes our great mission and most cherished reward. That's what it's like. That's what it's going to be like when God makes all things new. And while we hope and wait for that time, we can see glimpses of that mountain through the fog when we choose to celebrate God's abundance here and now. And that's his conclusion to chapter 8. And I think it's a point worth remembering when we are operating in spaces where there's not a lot of wins, where there's not a lot of hope sometimes, when there's not a lot of um, beauty, is that these are things that in some small way we can participate in creating in the midst of suffering and struggle. And I know that for me personally, I don't feel like doing that. Uh, I value it. There's been um, some things that as I'm struggling with them, like I don't know what to do. And I have a tendency to shut down when I'm maxed out, when I'm stressed, or when I'm encountering a, a difficult time in my life. And the times that I'm in that, my wife encourages me. She's like, let's go. You know, our friends have invited us to go do this. Let's go. And I was like, I don't feel like it. I don't want to be around people. And um, she says, I hear you and I understand, but I think you'll feel better or at least it'll be good for you to go. And then I do. And I just, for even just that brief time, I feel life again. I feel like things are going to be okay, whatever that is. And um so special thanks to my wife for <laughs> reminding me that there's there's a, a world outside that sometimes can help me. Um, but yeah, sometimes we have to carve out our own beauty. It's not just going to come to us. We have to make do with the situation we have on hand, even if we don't feel like it. And it's valuable to do. So I feel like I feel like this was a good chapter. I feel like he touches on a lot of difficult parts and points that are um, just exist in this, this world and certainly in this field that he works in. So moving on to the conclusion of the book, he kind of starts this on um, how we read the Bible. He talks about one of his teachers. Uh, I, I think he says, Dr. Green, I'm guessing he's talking about Joel B. Green um, at Fuller Theological Seminary. And one of the lessons that they were taught there was this, you know, this idea that sometimes we approach the Bible uh, prescriptively, like it should just tell us, you know, this, this, and this, and it's a rule book or it's some sort of um, manifesto to life or whatever. And his teacher kind of encourages the students to remind themselves that the Bible is just telling us who God is. And um, I might have some theological quibbles with exactly how that's said, but I'm going to put those aside because I do think there is kind of an important lesson here in what he's trying to address for his purposes. But if the Bible is telling us who God is, then we take a different posture than if we approach the Bible as though it should tell us something about you know, what we should do here, here, and here, or um, what decisions we should make, or or so on and so forth. And that's a whole other series, podcast-wise, that, you know, I may or may not get into. But for right now, um, you know, this is kind of where he's at in seminary. And so they use an example of, um, in Luke chapter 8, the sower of, or the parable of the sower. And uh, he quotes here from, Luke uh, chapter 8 says, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. 
Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As he said this, he called out, let anyone with ears to hear listen. And so he relates this to some sermons or messages that you've probably heard where the person asks, well, what kind of soil are you? And using his professor's idea of here of, of, you know, who is God in this passage? One thing that becomes obvious is that um, the soil is not an active participant in the story. The soil just is what it is by nature of its environment and what kind of situation that soil finds itself in. The real um, point of the story is what kind of farmer is this? Because you can see that this farmer is just throwing uh, seed, good seed, on all soils, good soil, bad soil, whatever. It's it's this sort of gracious giving of itself to even things that don't deserve it, might not utilize it, whatever you want to say. And he kind of equates this with God, doesn't use poor seed for poor soil. In short, the kind of soil is irrelevant to the good seed. Uh, this idea of um, what I think he would call grace is what he's getting at here, that God's goodness is for everyone, not just the right kind of people who just happen to be the right kind of soil. And he feels like this should reflect in how we carry ourselves and how we hold ourselves um, in, our, in our lives and our mission and what we're doing here. So I feel like this really captures kind of his ethos that he's laying down here is that if God, who is good and gracious, gives to us when sometimes, oftentimes, we don't deserve it, who are we to deny goodness to others? Um, and he lets that kind of inform the mission and what he's got going on. And so he wraps this part of the conclusion. He kind of shifts the focus to a new sort of urgency, which is uh, at the time, uh, 2020, he, was, he started writing this book. Obviously, that coincides with COVID, which is an event that a lot of us experienced and had never experienced ever before. Um, so you know, the whole upending of society, basically, and not just here in the U.S., but all over the world, it was pretty traumatic and and had a lot of uh, knock-on effects throughout our society. Their initial concern as this hit was whether it would hit the unhoused populations harder than, say, um, our house populations. It actually turns out that that wasn't uh, playing out the way that they thought it would. It turns out living outdoors with plenty of air is uh, less likely to spread disease, uh, communicable disease anyways, uh, than being indoors or in an office. And so while that community did not experience um, an increased hit of, say, like COVID or whatever, what did change was their access to infrastructure. So when COVID hit, a lot of churches and service providers, organizations um, either withered or dialed back or closed altogether the resources that they were providing for people in unhoused situations. They were now faced with um, less resources available to them than they had before. And I can speak from experience that when this happened, you know, you have to rethink and get creative. Um, at the time, I was an elder at Gather, and we had been doing um, a thing where you can come into one of our buildings and basically do grocery shopping. You can grab what you need. We had it all kind of organized, put out, and you could walk your way through just like you would a grocery store, get what you need, and get some bags of groceries, and get out. And when this hit, we had to kind of rethink well, we can't have people coming in right now. Um, what do we do? And so we did this idea of this food box system, and we called it Gather Stock Box. And what we would do is prepare ahead of time um, boxes that had, you know, a good array of different types of things that we had on hand. And then we developed a system to deliver those out to people. And uh, a lot of people 
participated in this uh, in different ways. We had um, organizations with like food banks that were able or um, uh, organizations that had like food stuffs, things that we could uh, get together. We had um, people that were on staff that could sort and arrange all that stuff separately and safely. And then uh, putting those in the boxes, we had there was companies that came together to provide boxes for gather to to get these things out to the communities. Then we had drivers, and then we even had um, a staff member devise a very cool delivery system. So you can give a driver the papers they need, and they just had to follow the route, and the boxes would get where they need to go. We partnered with other churches in East Lewis County to get a bunch of boxes there, and then they can continue to spread them out from there. Um, it was a whole network of people having to operate under different circumstances than what we were used to. We were used to working centralized and we kind of had to shift to working decentralized. And it was a challenge, but it was also needed. Uh, the request for food boxes went up and up and up. And it was just, uh, it, it's a crazy time. We've talked about that on the podcast before um, and all the things that went into that and how many boxes ultimately were delivered in like a year um, and just crazy numbers, uh, really reflective though of food scarcity in our area and that struggle. Um, but it required creative thinking and kind of doing things differently than what we had done. And a lot of other places, um, I mean, they either didn't have the resources or the ability or whatever to maintain whatever they were providing. Therefore, they kind of shuttered and the community that they were helping, homeless people, the unhoused population, were the ones to suffer for it. And so as that happened, though, we also see that COVID greatly reduced the availability of infrastructure. Um, you know, churches and volunteer organizations dried up, public spaces like libraries and parks were closed, and uh, nonprofit employees and service providers, things like nurses or whatever, they experienced burnout, staffing shortages. I mean, COVID was just just a massive hit to our society and not just our society, the world as a whole. I mean, things were still reeling from the effects of that. And I, I want to bracket out the whole political part of it or whether things should have been shut down or not shut down or whatever, just talking about where things were at, period. And what it did was greatly upend services that used to be available to a certain population that were no longer. So he goes on and he quotes this. While unhoused folks may not be getting sick from COVID-19 at disproportionate rates, reduced access to hygienic facilities and healthcare has had major ramifications on health and wellness. Isolation has escalated the symptoms of mental illness and people I've seen capably managing their mental health are now more dysregulated and unstable than they have been in years. The increase in overdose deaths has drastically exceeded the normal year-over-year -year increase. And I, I, I've seen that in our own community when we talk about um, the unhoused population and it's not even just the unhoused population. I think our population as a whole has gotten uh, angrier, more divisive, more split politically, religiously, communally, like whatever you want to – you look at the metrics and it, there's definitely just a very strong feeling that things are, um, are rough out there. And we see that reflected in the unhoused population as well. And so he goes on, and I I'm primarily got quotes here because I want to wrap this up, but I also think he says it better than I could. But he's got these things, these uh, measures to address the unhoused have increased since COVID. And these are the measures. So I'm going to read from you uh, from the book and then talk about it. In Los Angeles, a current council member and mayoral candidate plans to build mass emergency shelters and require unhoused people to utilize them under threat of arrest. The current mayor of Portland similarly suggested building three mega shelters, each with a maximum occupancy of 1,000 residents, supervised by the National Guard, and a subsequent ban on street camping. He goes on to say, This trend is surfacing across the United States, and I fear it will only get worse. 
It is often wrapped in the language of compassion and empathy, but it is in actuality an effort to hide the problem of homelessness instead of addressing it. Laws are even being enacted to target groups offering basic needs to unhoused people. The city of Brookings, Oregon passed an ordinance to restrict churches to offering free meals only twice a week. And a month later, Newark, New Jersey announced its own ordinance to require permits for distributing food in public. I like to quote this uh, part here uh, to talk about like, yeah, we're seeing these what I consider more punitive responses since COVID and after COVID to homelessness and the unhoused. Um, We've had several of our own ordinances and laws enacted here in our county, in our cities, and, and so on, that are what I, like said before, consider punitive toward the population that they're trying to address. Um, and yeah, go back, read my articles or listen to previous podcasts. We'll get into that. And maybe someday it might be worth going back and saying like, hey, where are we now? What did these do? What does it look like? Um, there are people working on the situation all over. Uh, some They're going to be across the spectrum in terms of advocate or critic. Um, but we've certainly, I, I feel like our community has reflected in its own tiny part exactly what he's writing about here. And so he kind of wraps this chapter up, this conclusion of like how we define success. And this, I think, gets into my term of how we talk about economically talk about people, like how we refer to people, how we relate to people. He says, in my second job interview at the center, our executive director asked me a question that I find poignant even to this day. How would you feel if someone who you meet on your first day is still in the exact same place and situation two, five, or even 10 years from now? Would you be able to handle that? And that question is kind of loaded question. He gets into this a little bit, but I think without knowing who the person is, like our responses could be different. If that person, we might look at that person and determine, oh, they're still needing these services or they're still living in this community or in this way. Um, Therefore, we have not been successful, but you might not be capturing what that person's life was like before. Were they just like a total drifter? Did they find community? Did they find a place to land even if materially they're still struggling or, um, you know, did their – what would normally prevent them from sticking around? Did that improve? I mean there's just a lot of things that we can judge by the eye that could be wrong based off of more knowledge of the person at hand. He goes on to say, he says, in fact, I've learned that when someone is in the exact same place after five years, it may even be cause for celebration – That means the person stayed connected, stayed alive. In a world that is arranged to discard and forget the most vulnerable, survival is not a given, and resiliency is a miracle. He goes on to say, To die to ourselves, our saviorism, our expectations, our design of what success looks like, and keep going. Grace means we never give up on our neighbors, just as God never gives up on us. I feel like I, I feel like there's definitely <laughs> a lot to consider there. Um, I don't disagree with him. I think situation at hand has forced so many people to have to think more creatively about how they do that than they did before. Um, I think we're going to have to continue to come up with more creative ways of engaging people that continues to provide beauty and grace and community and all these things. Uh, The difficulty is definitely there. It is a very real situation that we find ourselves in. Um, But I do think that some of it's going to have to be rethinking, like, what does success look like? Um, Or maybe to put it a different way, are we being good for goodness sake? (laughs) Uh, To quote a Christmas song, um, Really, I mean, this goes back to that whole economical way of thinking. And I'm not ignoring the fact that there's costs associated associated with this stuff or that uh, resources can be tight or anything like that. But I am wanting to stress that sometimes 
we provide food for somebody because that's the right thing to do, not because they deserve it or have earned it. Um, and there's many other things that we can do as a community along those same lines. Um, like I said, it's going to take creativity. It's going to take a constant reforming and rethinking how we do stuff. But we keep doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, anyways, he, he ends this conclusion on uh, Robert the artist. So Robert's somebody that's in their uh, local community. They see him when they go walk their dogs and, and so on. And they get talking to him. And, you know, he doesn't know... Robert's backstory all that much, but Robert's a character. It sounds like he's kind of been around the block a few times and he's had quite a bit of lived experience. He wouldn't be surprised if Robert had been homeless at one point either. And uh, Arthur, or sorry, Robert would talk a person's ear off um, about the things he's working on. He was lonely. And so he often engaged with the author to to discuss what he was working on. Uh, and one of the paintings or one of the things, I don't know if it's a painting, uh, that he was working on was um, this huge sweeping portrait of hell ascending up into heaven or heaven descending down into hell where you see heaven at the top here and it works its way down and things get you know darker and grimier and more hell-like. And uh, one time the author was talking to him and he showed him what he had and he only had the hell part completed, not the heaven part. And Kevin, and I asked him, is it harder to paint uh, heaven than it is to paint hell? And the man replied with something along the lines of, well, I know what hell looks like. I, I'm not quite sure what heaven looks like. And this goes back to the theme that he's had in here, which is, you know, finding pockets of beauty and grace, even if maybe we're living in hell, <laughs> to, to use his terms more crassly, um, to, to forge community, to forge this kind of stuff is what he's getting at, even if we can't control the entire environment that we're in, um, you know, grow where you're planted sort of thing. And so that wraps up this entire series on the book, Grace Can Lead Us Home, A Christian Called End Homelessness. Um, it's been a good book for discussion. I think it it brought up a lot of uh, good things to consider and think about and reflect on. I think we, everybody, regardless of where you land on these topics, could get some value out of the book if they have an open heart and uh, open mind to just thinking about it a little bit differently. So I just want to thank you for my audience for being patient while um, it's taken a long time to get episodes out. Um, I've kind of gone in fits and starts. Um, you know, life is life. Um, I I have no desire to turn this into some sort of commercial thing. And so one of the side effects of that is that I just do what I want when I want or when I feel like I have the time or capability to do so. Um, but I would like to thank the community that's engaged in this, the conversations that I've had with lots of people, um, people out there trying to think what little small way they can help in this situation and with our unhoused population. Um, I'd just like to thank for thank everybody who's who's participated. And so this wraps up this series, and I'm trying to think about what I want to do next. Um, I might do another series on a different book, um, might move away, likely will move away from the topic of um, homelessness or mental health or drug addiction because um, – I've covered that in abundance on this podcast, but I do have some things that I think would be valuable to continue discussions on other topics. Um, I also might consider doing more local uh, discussions, things that are more uh, pertinent to those who live in the Lewis County area of Washington. So I just want to end with thanking my audience, thanking everybody that discussed this and considered this and uh, shared resources with people and just elevated the conversation around these difficult topics. It's been, um, it's been kind of a crazy, crazy couple years here. 
Um, So once again, thank you. And um, I will catch you on the next episode.